we're going to talk about water. Water is life. There is no life without water. And I'm going to share my experience with swimming and what it taught me. Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Orthopreneurs Podcast. Today, I'm in a really good mood. I'm very happy because I have somebody very special here with me today who always makes me happy whenever I'm around her. Um, please uh, welcome to the Orthopreneur Show, Dr. Parul Taneja. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. You got it. Hey, guys. It's absolutely great to be here. Um, it's good to see you. I just saw you a couple of weeks ago. It's good to see you again. Yeah. For those people who don't know, Parul is part of the Orthopreneurs RD group, and we get together four to six times a year. We had our annual meeting in Nashville, and it was just such a blast getting to hang out and spend time with people I really care about um, because that's I, it's a tribe. It's really it's honestly people who really you know, people, I'm just going to go on a quick aside here, Parul, if you don't mind, because you mentioned it. You know, people come to me and say, what's RD about? And they think it's all about crushing the competition. They think it's all about, you know, every secret there is to learn or sitting in a room and going through spreadsheets of numbers all day long. And if I could sum it up at the end of the day, and you can correct me, it really is more of just a group of people, a core group of people who just really care about each other, right? Okay. Who kind of have each other's backs. And, and like to dance with each other. <laughs> 100%. I, I think that describes it perfectly. Yeah. And and again, a little insight. Uh, there was a band playing at the recent one and everybody was just dancing and having a good time. And that's at the essence of all of this. I think we all work equally hard. It's a matter of we need to play equally hard. And uh, I think we do that well. And that's why I said at the beginning, every time I see you, I smile. Because you make me so happy, Parul. And so as I start every um, interview, I'm just going to start with asking you, if you don't mind, if you could tell everybody a little bit about yourself out there. Like, how did you get to where you are today? What's your story professionally? And add whatever else you want to add. So I grew up in India, New Delhi. And um, this is insane, but I never, never wanted to be a dentist. My whole gig was to be in basic science with genetics or going to media. And my father is an orthodontist, and my mom decided that for financial security, I would be a dentist first, and I could go into anything else after. So I went to dental school in India, in the topmost school in Asia, finished dentistry, but along the way, I found ortho, and I absolutely loved it. And I applied to ortho school, so either it was that or to be on a television channel behind the camera, not in front. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I got into ortho school. So I went to the University of Oklahoma for ortho. I got my DMD at BU. And it's not like a linear journey. It's a crisscross journey because I was an international student. Right. And then once I came to Boston, as is the case with Boston, people love the city. We decide not to leave. We do not know about the cold when you decide to stay. <laughs> you always make the decision in July. We made the decision in July. That's that <laughs> happens. And I have a practice partner who I met uh, here. Um, I went to BU, he went to Tufts. We have two practices, one in Waltham, one in Chelsea. That's the greater Boston area. So we've been in practice on our own about nine years. Oh, wow. Associate before that. Got burnt a lot, learned a lot. Yeah. And and I'm, I'm in a really outside, in a great place now, in a fabulous place. You know, That's, amazing. That's yeah. a great saying, by the way. If it doesn't exist, we should in invent that saying. Burned a lot, learned a lot. Oh, I have to send you the music. There's music to that saying? It's, it's uh, It comes from a very romantic song about heartbreak. Everything about you, whenever I ask you any question, it involves, it's very romantic, it's very dramatic. It's like, you were meant for the arts. You really were. <laughs> Well, there's artistry in our field. There is great artistry in orthodontics. I, I think I have a, I have an associative problem. I tend to draw and connect things together from the sciences, from the arts, from music. But uh, nah, nah, my creative side is not very high. It's, wow. to, you, you know, it's limited to the field in a big way. It's not a problem drawing things in. I think it's a gift, honestly. I think too few people have that gift of being able to draw art and science together. Uh, I have a daughter who is blessed with that gift and people like you go far in life. It's a beautiful thing because people tend to be very right-brained or they tend to be very left-brained. You know, when I speak to you, 
Um, you are for those people out there who don't know Parul, she is re- remarkably unique. If you can use that word, right? How can you be remarkably unique? It's kind of a strange combination there, in the sense that when you when I speak to you, I always feel like I'm speaking to a scientist, right? Because like in in my heart of hearts, I always feel like you're very very precise. That that things about you, and maybe I have you totally pegged wrong, but the words you use, the the way you describe things, is very very precise. It's not a broad thirty thousand foot. You're in it, talking about it, and then on the same token, when I talk to you, it's there's always a reference to something artistic, which is beautiful. It's such a gift to have. And my daughter, who is a STEM girl, she's all about engineering and science. She also, and she's a righty, not a lefty. But she does the most gorgeous drawings and cartoons, and so, she sewed her own prom dress from scratch. And I, I feel like you're like that. So, uh, okay, you're saying this, and look at Steve Jobs. That's exactly him, STEM, but super creative. So, I, hey, I think you and Steve Jobs. Things. No, not me. I don't have that much of STEM. I'm thinking about your daughter. It's wow. Generation. Well, I will say this, you you do have great insight on life, which is part of the reason why I want you here today. And um, I know you've got a great story to tell people out there. Um, and just so everybody out there knows, when we have conversations with people who are on the show, I I am there's lots of really good people who come before me, right? Who've done podcasts and podcasts in the orthodontic world. I don't sit down to some people's consternation and say, let's go through the whole show step-by-step, A to Z. I want to hear the story organically when people tell it and because it allows me to have a better view. And so you should all understand that for me and Parul, you know, she's got a great journey that I'm about to learn about with you, but I know the broad sense of it. And it relates to something really interesting that she's done in her life and something that's taught her a lot. And so Parul, I want to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about what is it that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about water. Water is life. There is no life without water. And I'm going to share my experience with swimming and what it taught me. And most of this is from this year. The past two years have been hard for all of us with COVID and loss and health, multiple things. I grew up in New Delhi and it's landlocked. I taught myself to swim at a local pool watching other people. To put this in perspective about how close the economy was, Lycra was a relatively foreign concept. So finding- like, like, Lycra? Lycra, the stretch oh, yeah. that goes into swimsuits. So Lycra was relatively a foreign concept. So finding a decent swimsuit was, you know, in itself, the holy grail. Right. So I teach myself to swim, head out of the water, no idea about strokes. But I love it enough that I taught myself and then it disappeared from my life. Came back in dental school a little bit, swam a little bit, and it left. And about a decade or so ago, finally, I took lessons and I learned how to swim. And it coincided with the time when I was in Greece, the first time in my life. And I laid my eyes on the Aegean Sea. Oh, and all of us have you know, reactions to things that are bigger than ourselves, reactions to nature. And one look at that blue and water, I felt like this had been a part of me. This was something I lost in another lifetime that I belong here. And it really cemented that affinity for water, like looking at that sea. And recently someone said this to me that, uh, you know, life dreams its dreams through us. I don't know, you know, you have a calling, you decided you were a dentist, you became an orthodontist, something called to you. Right. And many times we don't choose that calling. It happens to us. And that's how I feel about the water. It happened to me, a kid from a landlocked area, not a lot of access to water. And open water swimming became a wish, a desire. And yes, I went, you swim on beaches, but you never go out into open sea or into a river or anything of the sort. And right now, can I ask you a question? Do you mind? Go for it. So so just to back up for a second. So you taught yourself to swim in New Delhi, right? Um, And that was in a pool, obviously, because landlocked. And then you went to, you saw in Greece, you saw the, the water. At that point, 
you were still swimming through dental school in, in pools, right? You were just only you know? pools and not very much and terribly, like no head in water, no knowledge of different strokes, nothing. It's just uh, someone tr- literally keeping your head above the water kind of swimming. Right. But but then you go to Greece, you see this gorgeous, which I can attest to for anybody who's ever seen it. It looks like a giant swimming pool, just a huge, gorgeous, blue, green swimming pool that you just it's calling to you. It's like, I got to get in this thing. And you didn't know why. You just knew that this was going to be a part of your life at some point. Somehow, some way you were going to make this a part of your life. Right. Yeah, and, you know, there are seeds that are sowed in us and we don't even know that they're happening. So for me, this was something like that. Okay. So, I mean, I've been to Greece many times, but never really gone into open sea. And this year I had personal, you know, personal challenges. You face loss and you face the mortality of your loved ones. And difficult times give us a measure of our relationships, of your friends, of people who will stay with you or not with you. And somehow it connected to, there is no wisdom in waiting anymore. There is no wisdom in putting off the things that you want to do. And the first thought that came to me was open water. And I decided that this is the year I'm going to start swimming seriously and going to start swimming in the open water seriously. So, this is spring and I'm swimming in the pool and for those of who you know Boston and have heard of a very very disgusting body of water called the Charles River or have seen it the Charles River once a year has a race it is the only time it's open to swimmers and I decided to sign up for that race there is no comparison with the Aegean and the filth that this water body is <laughs> There is a comparison. It's just not a favorable comparison. Not a favorable comparison. But, you know, you make do. Do you wait to go overseas every time? You make do. So that is step one. You make do. What do you have available? What are you going to do with it? I have this available. This is what I'm going to attempt. Boston is cold. So just to put this in perspective, indoor pools have temperatures at around 77 Fahrenheit. This race is going to be sometime in June. and no open water body in the area is accessible to you until the end of May, until after Memorial Day. So through the spring, I swim in pools. I swim in pools. And yes, you are hitting a good distance and you're building technique and you're building strength. And the first opportunity to practice in open water that I had was in Walden Pond. Um, If you've read Walden, I haven't read it. I'm very ashamed. Um, Thoreau and his whole civil disobedience, yada, yada, yada. It's it's a pond, okay? 1.7 miles shoreline, 120 feet deep. It's a pond. Illegal to swim there if there is a lifeguard present. If you want to die, you die on your own time. So after the training through the spring, Memorial Day comes, it goes, and now is the time to make the first attempt in the New England area, in open water, which is Walden Pond. It's 5.45 in the morning. It's one hour away from my home. So you've gotten up like a schmuck at 4.30. That's how you feel. Like, why are you doing this? And I reach uh, the pond, and it's quiet, and it's gray. It's pretty. It, there, there's a beauty to it. Not fabulous beauty, but some beauty to it. There are other open water swimmers. And I'm looking at this pond and my only thought is how am I going to beat the clock what is my time going to be to finish a a mile which is the distance I have to cover in the river all right you're standing there shivering the water temperature is at least 10 to 15 degrees lower than what you're used to in the pool but you have a wetsuit on right it'll be fine and And, and by the way can I just again comment at this moment for a second? Because back in the day, I used to do a lot of open water swimming myself. Mm-hmm. And what people don't understand, and I think you're going to get to this a little bit, I'm guessing we're going to talk a little bit later on. A, it's cold. I get that. The wetsuit helps a little bit, but there's nothing like that first shocking moment when you jump in the water at 5.45 or 5.30 in the morning. However, I always tell people there's a big difference when you train for triathlons or whatever between running and jogging. 
Jogging is put on shoes, go out for a light run and enjoy the scenery. When there's time involved, everything changes. It's no longer just about enjoyment. Now you're racing against the clock and your whole mindset before you jump in that water has a purpose, which people don't recognize until they've trained specifically for like I used to do triathlons. Right. It, it's not, a, it's, it's a different thing. And I wanted to make that clear that you're, it's 545, it's dark, you're about to jump in the water, it's cold. And your mindset is that there's a time I need to be. So this is really going to go somewhere here. <laughs> okay. you, you set the stage for, for something wonderful. See, I didn't even know. You, you see how it's working out, Parul? absolutely did. Okay. All right. I go in. The water is warmer than the ambient conditions. Great. And you wade in. And there's leaves and dirt and felt. And okay, no big deal. I remember I put my head in the water and that cold that hits you in the face. You cannot see your hand. You can't see anything. The water is completely dark and my limbic system kicks in. I start to gasp for breath. I'm five strokes in. I feel this insane constriction around my belly. My legs are giving away. And I turn back and come to shore and I stand there. That was my first New England, not even a minute in open water. That's amazing. And can I tell you, I'm gonna tell you a secret, but don't tell anybody, okay? This is just between you and me. Nobody nobody out there can hear this, okay? It's just between me. When I did, when I did triathlons, I trained in master swim in the morning at 5 a.m. in the pool. I trained for my first triathlon, it was a sprint. I got in line. I got in the water with everybody. The gun went off in Seattle. Warm water, 72, 74 degrees in a wetsuit, clear water. I took five strokes and couldn't swim anymore. I stopped. I stood up. I swam again. Couldn't swim anymore. Same exact thing you're experiencing. I experienced my first time. And I literally could. I was having a panic attack. I could not swim. And I had to tell my body that I was safe. And I was okay because this was the middle of a triathlon. And unlike you, I didn't practice beforehand in open water. And I, I literally had the toughest time swimming. And I've been swimming since I'm a baby. And it was a hard, so I know exactly what you're going through. People who've never been through it don't realize your body shuts down. You cannot move. This is, it gets, it gets better or worse, you know, take your pain. Well, sorry. I just want to let you know you weren't alone. Okay, thank you. I, I, I began to realize that slowly, but it is for someone who's trained a little bit in the pool, you go in and you do not realize you like what just happened to you. There is a reason open water is an extreme sport. You know, I thought about this a lot. People ski, people do this. Your breath is on the line. And if you are looking to live in the moment, put your head under water in an unknown place. In that moment, all I wanted to do was to find a way to breathe. I came back and there are two voices. I mean, I don't know how many voices live in your head. Mine, there's a collection of voices, but that day there were two. <laughs> and there's one voice that's telling you, what are you even doing here? Like you don't belong here. I'm by no means an athlete. Why are you standing here? And then there's a competing voice, which it's a voice above the orthodontist, above the daughter above the sister, above every single role you play in your life on a daily basis. It is the voice of you as a life form. And it tells you, this is all you got. That this is all you have in this moment is to go back in and find out. So I like to say this, I'm always, I think I'm on the hunt, this is me. I'm on the hunt of who I can become. And it was one of those moments that you have to go back in. I go back in. Instead of five strokes, much like you said, it's seven, and you come back to shore. And it's the same fear that won't release. It's it's a fear for, it sounds probably dramatic to say this, but yeah, it's kind of a fear for survival. You have zero control over the rhythm of your breath. You have zero control on your body position, and you're trying to regain that. At this time in the morning when it's dark, you cannot see anything. You can't see anything at all. I did this slowly and the feet began to change to yards. 
I did this for 35 minutes. Nice. Amazing. And I came out and called me crazy. And I decided that I was coming back in the evening after the day was done. The day passes. You try not to think about it. You don't register it as a total failure on your, on your head, but you kind of feel like a little bit of a loser. Like you realize that you were not that in the pool, but over here you could be. And I go back around four or five o'clock in the evening. And now the sun is out. The water is warmer. You go back in. And guess what? There's light streaming through the water. You can actually see your hand. And you start to swim. You can do 100 yards. Okay, let's try going to the next level, 200. That's enough. Come back to shore. Go back again a little bit to 50. Come back to shore. Go back in another 40 minutes. So the first thing that happened was that the person in the morning and the person in the afternoon or the evening were completely different people. That's the first thing that happened. I spent all of five days in Walden Pond because I had five days before the race to be in open water anywhere. As I said, it's illegal to jump in the river and race. So you, you do what you can. Um, five days pass. And you regain your confidence. And by the fifth day, I'm hitting the middle of the pond, which is, you know, where it's really deep. No issues. I can do this. Uh, come the day of the race, you have your gear together at night. Everything is in your backpack. And, you know, you have eaten the gluten-free pasta because that's the fuel you need the next day. And, yeah, you're really getting into this. You know, you're really going to do this. You reach the Charles. You recognize the hundred other people who share your insanity. You tell any Bostonian you're willingly going to go into the river. They will look at you and say, there isn't enough money in the world for me to jump into the draws. No one jumps into that river. You fall into it because, you know, you were on the crew team. You fell off the sailboard, but you don't jump into the draws. We reached there. We as an, I had a friend accompany me that day. You can see MIT across. The Esplanade is beautiful where we usually have music. And we need to go, and you, you guys, if you are interested, you can look up the map, right? We need to jump off the dock, go to the Harvard Bridge, come back to the Longfellow, which is by the Mass General Hospital, and come back to dock. That's the mile. And they have their buoys set up. Well and good. Now, I have done Walden Pond. I know Boston waters. I am going to do this. So right before the swim, we did, you know, there's this nice gentleman giving you some anti-fog for your goggles. And uh, I add the anti-fog. And I don't realize I accidentally touched the film of the anti-fog. And this will come into play in a moment. The second wave begins. We jump in. And the same thing happened. It's that hit of cold water oh. on your face. The same constriction returns. And this time, the water is that much darker. It has the stench of fuel because the river has boat traffic. It's colder and now there is chop. There is a lot of chop. And one more time, I have the exact same thought, what am I doing here? I should leave. I, I can't deal with this, this is too much. Am I going to drown today? And then that second voice comes back, this is all you've got. So 40 minutes, I didn't finish the mile, but I made it to the bridge. I tread the river. Uh, I try to focus on, you know, right hand, left hand. Don't cross the line of the body with your hand. Could correct your technique. But somehow I made it to that distance. And then I came out of the water. So this is failure two. And I'm going to jump ahead in the story and then come back. I finished my first sea race in October and super high winds with insane chop in Greece. 1.5K in 36 minutes. So success came eventually. Nice. A couple of months later, but there are two things I learned from these three experiences, which I would like to share. Sure, please. The first thing it taught me was great humility. Great humility because we do not approach our circumstance. We approach it with confidence, but not with the ego of what has been achieved in the past. 
So my first mistake at Walden Pond was because I could do something in the pool, I assumed I would do it in water. It's not the same circumstance. Right. That lack of humility, you do not know the temperature, you don't know the murkiness, you don't know your own physical or mental state. So you are dealing with a bunch, bunch of unknowns. And what that ego does of past achievement, if you want to call it that, it takes away the malleability of your mind and it contributes to your blind spots. And I made the exact same mistake at Charles River. Because I could do Walden Pond now, I can do Charles River. And one more time, I was in a new circumstance, unaware of what was going to greet me, but I was carrying Walden Pond on my back. So the, the first lesson of things for me was that you carry your skill, you carry your technique, but you do not carry, just the way you do not carry the weight of your failures, you, your success has a weight to it. If you carry the weight of your success to your next endeavor, it will limit you or worse, it will drown you because you are so consumed with what you had done that you're failing to see what's in front of you. And that was a very, very meaningful lesson for me. Why I finished the race in the Aegean, yes, the water is beautiful, but it was cold. The winds were high enough that sea taxis were not allowed the day before to, you know, be in the ocean. I approached it with great humility. I approached it with a sense of, let me see what I can make of it, not with, I got this. I'm going into new waters. Let me see what I can make of it. And that changed everything. The second realization I had was in the third race that you go in and you're starting to swim. And yes, you're against the clock like we talked about. But more than against the clock, I like this. I like to swim. Swimming means something to me. I love the water. And the pleasure of the activity returned. And we go through life driven by our fears, which are a very powerful fuel. Fear is a fabulous fuel. We do great things out of fear but we can also do great things out of pleasure. And the way I tie this to practice, I will first go with the humility piece because we are orthodontists and yes, right. life lesson is great. We all have those trouble patients. You look at it on the schedule and you hold your head like another day with this one. It really changed my attitude to anyone coming in who has been given that label of a troubled patient or a pain in the neck kind of patient. Hmm. You saw them 10 weeks ago. Do you know what happened to them in 10 weeks? You made an assumption that this is the people they are and this is the people they will remain. So I started to go in without a preconceived notion or a decision about this person. And that was the, the humility part that I don't know about this person, I'm going to go in and I'm going to make up this appointment what it is. And call me crazy, the number, I mean, there are not a lot of them, but the interactions with these people, they don't seem as difficult anymore to me. They're easier. They seem like nicer people because maybe I lost a blind spot. Maybe there is a greater compassion towards them. Something shifted. And like I, you know, we were talking before this, intellectually, we know a lot of these things, but till you go through a physical process or an action related process that helps you face something within you, a fear, or realize that pleasure is a powerful fuel, the experience of it for me brought all of this into, you know, great relief. It brought it into awareness. And it started to build strength in practice in your day-to-day -day dealing. And I again, I'll use the same word, malleability of the mind, that you are not going in with a very preconceived notion about another human being. Because if I had a preconceived notion about myself that led to a less than optimal result, I could be you know, imposing that preconceived notion on the person in front of me. So that was one. The other two things, I don't know if you want to ask me anything because- No, I mean- you, you you cover you cover the topic in such great detail. There's not a lot to ask about. You you covered it, it which is, you know, looking at things from the perspective you're describing. It's super important. Um, you know, mindset is everything. 
right? So yeah, open water is a mind game. And the more you your mind is calm, the more you can talk to yourself, the easier it gets. But humility was huge. Pleasure was huge. I have friends who are building these fabulous practices, picking out fabulous lighting structures and designs, and they are stressed and afraid. And I tell them so, that I told them that you are missing it. There is pleasure to be had. This is what you wanted. And you're going to get old and you'll have this fabulous practice that you would have totally missed on the process that should have given you great joy and great pleasure. So it shifted. It internally starts to shift something in you in a very meaningful way. The other two things, which Glenn, you probably know about open water, and I'm going to use them as um, parallels, is the buoy. You know the buoy, right? The safety buoy. Yes, ma'am. So if you are swimming alone or if you are swimming in areas where help is not at hand, you use the buoy. You use use buoy in uh, sea crossings as well. The buoy is made me think of safety nets. The buoy in reality slows you down. It's a drag. And it got me thinking, you know, buoys are a big variety of shapes, sizes. Just the way in a race you need to optimize the size of the buoy, or if you're doing a sea crossing, you need to optimize your safety nets. As your technique, your strengths build, you really need to adjust your safety net. We are in practice, there are very few decisions we make that are irreversible. And for whatever reason, we do not take a chance on things. And it is that buoy that's creating drag. It's holding you back in a big way. So that was the other huge takeaway from me. Um, And again, it brought it into my awareness in a big way that your safety nets need to be optimized based on circumstance. No circumstance is the same. Yesterday, today, yes, we know our practice, we know our staff, but if you approach it as walking into something new, you will find out things about others and yourself, good things and bad things, but they are going to help you make better decisions. Last, sighting. So again, in open water, because it's not the pool and you don't have the lines on the floor guiding you, you got to look at the shore. Or in a race, you have these large buoys to direct you. you got to look at the buoy. Where are you going? And every 10 strokes, you look up and you see where you're going. And you take a snapshot and you put your head in water and you do what you're doing. 10 strokes, you take a snapshot. And if you do not take those snapshots, you are going to either land at a different shore, cover a 1.5K by swimming a 2K, tired and exhausted. If you hit a current, you are not going to force correct or change your technique in any which way. And that's the other reminder I have for everyone listening. Sight. Do you know where you're going and how often are you looking at that picture? And I would say look at that picture over and over and over because Whatever it is, whatever your dreams are, whatever your final destination is, in the process of getting there, are you expending unnecessary energy? And if you're not looking again and checking in where you're going, you're wasting energy and time. You could probably do double the distance. Maybe you want one practice, you could have two, but you're not looking at where you're going. So that was, um, again, it came back into awareness. And, you know, we we rescheduled this podcast a couple of times, Glenn. Yeah. And it took me a while to find words. And I'm, you know, Jeannie Moody and I were talking about synchronicity uh, when we met at RD and a shout out to her. Um, as soon as I finished all of this, I ran into this book called Flow. Have you heard of it? I have. And the author who has a very, very, I think he's Polish, he has a very, very long and very difficult name. So I'm not going to try and pronounce it. I ran into this book and he talks about how we take action for the sake of action sometimes for our calling to find out what exists between us, our fears, whatever it is that you need to defeat a little bit. And it makes us unique and it separates us from the crowd. And he calls this process differentiation. At the same time, he talks about the fact that there are other people who appreciate the same sense of commitment and discipline. So you integrate into a community and both those features together make us a more complex 
not to be confused for difficult, a more complex but a more ordered human being. And it is exactly like if I had to put it in one line, I think this is what my journey started to do. It begins to order consciousness. It led me to make certain other decisions that, you know, I put on the back burner for years. And despite the fact that this was a hard year, one full of difficulties, disappointments, loss, I think I am in a better place than I've ever been. And I hope to continue to build from it. I would suggest that find what calls to you. I found that the person who's me, Parul, without any of these many roles that I play in my life, has something bigger in her than these roles offer. And there is there is not an eventual goal. When I'm swimming, I'm not an Olympic athlete. I'm not, you know, I guess I feel I could go back. There's not. There wasn't anything riding on it, but it led to growth, which other places, you know, they did not provide the same platform. I mean, what you're talking about is more than ortho, right? It's more than than swimming. So again, on the heels of the podcast we did a few weeks ago, uh, give or take, I think a month or so ago with Robert Trujillo talking about burnout, talking about stress, talking about toxicity talking about people needing to get help. For some people, this stuff comes very simply, right? For you, it was a process. You got there, you understood it. There's a large number of people out there right now listening who've never, ever been in touch with this side of themselves. And, you know, I, I think there's some real value in what you're talking about. And and I think the story that you describe is so deep and so complex that, You know, people are going to listen to this a couple of times to hear, again, the thought process behind it again. But I do think um, your message is a strong one. And I think um, and I I first want to say thank you for sharing it, because I I think people the opportunity. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. And and again, I think anybody wants to reach out to you on Facebook should reach out to you with questions because people are going to ask questions along the way. Um, And again, and again, it's. Again, the the depth of what you described today is going to take a while to sink in with me. This isn't, it's not like, hey, here's my bonding technique. Like, awesome. Let's do it. I mean, this is, this is core life stuff. Um, that sort of, it's, it's for most people listening to this who are in the United States right now, there's a lot of Eastern philosophy in this stuff. There's a lot of broader spiritual mentality stuff in here. And so, um, I just want to say thank you. For bringing it today, Parul. And it's a pleasure. I want everyone to know one last thing. It ain't over till you're six feet under. It's never too late. It's never that the ship has sailed. Whatever you are finding to do, longing to do, listen to that voice and do it in small increments. It will grow. It'll build. It'll compound. Yeah. That that's what I tell everybody from my story, right? People people hear my story like you went back to Ortho at 44. Like, yeah, what's the big deal? Like, you know, I, the two words, I, you know, I would say are dream and do. So dream it, do it, period. Uh, everything else is just an excuse. And 100%. so from the bottom of my heart, Parul, thank you for being here today. Having thank me. thank you for doing this. And uh, I can't wait for the feedback we get from it. I think it's going to be amazing. And uh, I just want to say thank you. And uh Whatever the rest of your day brings you, I hope it's amazing. And I just can't wait uh, until our next conversation in person, wherever that may be. And so, um, yeah, just have a great day, okay? You too. Take care, Glenn. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.